announce that item number 16, AB 852, public post-secondary education, community colleges, that has been pulled at the author's request. Um, and item number 17, AB 925, assembly member Laura, that also has been uh, pulled at the request of the author. Welcome everyone. Let's thank you for putting up with our late starting time and uh, let us begin. We, we will do things in uh, sign in order, not sign in order on uh, the order our bills will be heard in file order. And our first author is uh, Assembly Member Knight, AB 13. Welcome to the committee, Assembly Member. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Today we are presenting AB 13. This has been a process that's going on for a couple of years. We've presented this bill and it's uh, had its difficulties and we've had our challenges, but most of those challenges have been uh, taken care of with amendments. The bill has now become a very narrow bill uh, from what it started out and uh, we believe we have addressed uh, all of the concerns that uh, committee members in the past have had. Parents send their children to school assuming that they will be safe when they attend school. Volunteers are not only volunteering with their own children, they're also volunteering with everyone else's children. There's a thousand kids in that school and I volunteer with my child, I'm volunteering with a thousand kids, not with mine. Assembly Bill 13 prohibits individuals who have been convicted of designated sex offenses or serious controlled substance felonies, including drug offenses, specifically relating to a minor from volunteering or assisting with public school district activities. Now let me be very clear on these charges. When this bill started, we put the bill forward as you were an employee. If you are convicted of several charges in the state of California, you cannot be an employee at a school district. This is a very, very broad code that we have adopted here in the state of California. What we have done over the last couple of years is we have narrowed these charges. There are not any misdemeanor charges on there. There are not narcotics charges on there that don't have to do with children. That is using children to sell drugs that is selling drugs on campuses, that is using children in concert with these sales. So we have narrowed these drug charges down to schools, to churches, to using children, very, very difficult charges to allow people to volunteer in schools. Existing law allows any individual to volunteer in school district activities unless that person is a registered sex offender. So registered sex offenders are already precluded from volunteering in school. Currently, school districts are authorized to fingerprint any individual wishing to volunteer and obtain a background check from a local authority or Department of Justice if they decide to conduct background checks. Most school districts do it with a DOJ check. And we will have that, it, if that becomes an issue with this bill, we can amend this bill and make it a DOJ check uh, without any problem. And we expect that almost every school district in the state uses a DOJ check. But if they use a local check, we can amend this bill. Current education code prohibits school districts from employing or retaining persons who have been convicted of designated sex offenses or controlled substance offenses, including many misdemeanor charges. You cannot work in the school district with many of these misdemeanor charges. Prohibition on employment stands unless the conviction was overturned, the person acquitted, or conviction dismissed. Assembly Bill 13 would conform restrictions of volunteers to not just these restrictions, but much more narrow. I have two people here who would like to testify that have been here several times before and we have talked about this. But just in, in quick closing, we took an amendment in uh, assembly education on a five-year washout rate. That means if you were convicted of a crime, 
on that date of conviction, you have five years before you can volunteer in school. Most, if not all of these charges, carry these three, six, and nine year terms. A lot of these people would either serve most of their time or all of their time behind bars before they could volunteer in school. So many of these people that want to volunteer in school will have served two, three, four years of that washout rate and then come out and have to stand one year before they can volunteer in school. This five-year washout rate from date of conviction, not date of exit of incarceration, date of conviction, makes this a very, very narrow bill, and I ask for your I vote. Witnesses in support. Can you please bring the microphone close to you and, let's, let's, and, and make sure the red light is on. Press the button. Now you're on. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. My name is Stacy Bryant, and I'm the Chief Leadership Officer in the Palmdale School District. I've been a teacher and a public school administrator for 26 years, and I've sent my own children to public school. One of our highest priorities as administrators is to keep our schools safe for students. To that end, our campuses are restricted. Visitors must sign in and have a reason to be on campus. Additionally, we have local law enforcement who help us provide the safe environment. In the employment context, the legislature decided long ago that persons convicted of certain crimes should not be around children and therefore cannot be employed by public school districts. Unfortunately, we do not have the same protection when it comes to school volunteers. Although we do have a volunteer screening process in Palmdale, as do many other districts, when we receive a DOJ report that indicates a criminal conviction, which would prohibit the district from employing that person, there is no statutory prohibition against allowing them to volunteer. Rather, current education code as I understand it, with the exception of certain sex crimes, is the opposite, requiring re school districts to allow parents the right to volunteer in their children's school, regardless of their criminal conviction. Parents entrust their children to schools with the understanding and expectation that those in close contact with their children have been scrutinized and deemed fit to work in classrooms with children, to help children in the lunchroom and on the playground, and to assist on field trips. We are asking for a tool to ensure that this is the case for all adults on campus or field trips, not only those who the district happens to employ. While certainly we understand and encourage the desire of parents to volunteer at their children's schools, it does not make sense to allow an unpaid volunteer to work with children when the legislature decided that the same person cannot work with the same children in the same setting as a district employee. Parents don't just volunteer with their own children. They volunteer with everyone's children. And this comes down to student safety. The legislature already decided school districts shouldn't employ such persons. Having legal backing to prevent just a subset of the same persons, only those convicted of specified crimes and only those with convictions in the last five years from volunteering is a common sense extension that will significantly help to ensure student safety. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, we may have some questions later on, so we'll after we hear from the wit all the witnesses in support and then witnesses in opposition, we may ask you as the representative from Palmdale, which is, I believe, the, co the sponsor of the bill, to kind of respond. Other witnesses in support? Uh, good morning. Michael Garrison, Jr., also for Palmdale School District. This bill is about student safety, which we acknowledge must be balanced against providing or ensuring that parents have the opportunity to participate in their children's education. The very same education code sections granting parental rights to volunteer also guarantee students the right to a safe educational environment. As amended, the bill contains just a fraction of those offenses that would prevent a school district from employing uh, a person and we believe strikes a reasonable balance between these interests. As Assemblyman Knight stated, people with misdemeanor drug convictions, felony drug convictions not involving a minor, and non-sex crime convictions uh, more than five years old all could volunteer. 
the only remaining disqualifying drug convictions would be felonies, specifically involving minors, less than five years old. The district believes from a student safety perspective it is important to keep people who have been convicted of, for example, dealing drugs to children, using children to deal drugs, or dealing drugs at a school or near a school, away from students in any capacity completely for just a five-year period. Even then, the bill still contains safety valves that would allow people with disqualifying convictions to volunteer if they'd been through drug diversion, if they'd had their convictions set aside as provided in the penal code, or if they'd obtained a certificate of rehabilitation, or even informally convinced a particular school board they were in fact rehabilitated. And the whole process is permissive, which provides for local district level control. The prohibitions only apply in districts that choose to fingerprint volunteers. Most do, not all do. If a district did not want to be part of this process, they could simply opt out by not fingerprinting. This bill boils down to ensuring student safety, which the district believes is paramount. We ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Other witnesses in support? Good morning, Mr. Chair and Senators. Joshua Golka with the California School Employees Association. Aligning safeguards regarding volunteers to those that already exist for employees, even in a limited scope such as this bill, will help ensure the safety of all students, staff, and volunteers in California's public schools. And we ask for your eye vote. Thank you. Are there other witnesses in support? Are there witnesses in opposition? Maybe if the witnesses in support could just leave for a minute, I'm going to ask the, the representative from Palmdale to come back in a few minutes, but let's just let the witnesses in opposition come forward. Witnesses in opposition. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. Good morning. I'm Liz Guillen with Public Advocates, and I'm also here testifying in opposition on behalf of the Bay Area Parent Leadership Action Network. Uh, we strongly oppose. Districts can already deny volunteers, as this bill proposes. But now they will be required to deny certain volunteers, and they will not be able to benefit from the resource of volunteers. Stanford's Getting Down to Facts research actually quantifies this resource and concludes that districts in <laughs> districts in more affluent uh, and white communities have and use volunteers to a much greater degree than districts in low-income communities and communities of color. This bill will increase that resource disparity. Finally, this bill does away with local district discretion and it hurts students and their families. It will have a disproportionate and unfair impact on communities of color, poor communities and immigrant communities. Mr. LaFontaine and Ms. McMahon traveled today to describe the impacts on them. We urge a no vote. Thank you, other witnesses in opposition. Hi, my name is Sharice McMahon. I'm a um, youth advocate through um, Project What? which stands for, we're here and talking for the 2.4 million children of incarcerated parents in the United States, including myself. Um, being raised in Alameda County's foster care system, I rarely interacted with my parents due to the fact that my parents um, remained in and out of jail. My parents um, missed my birthdays, holidays, but most importantly to me, they missed my education. This bill is sort of restricting parents from involving themselves in children's education. I never had a hand to hold, um, first days of school, science fairs, field trips, but it never was a time that I wish I had had that hand. This is why I'm greatly aware and I greatly oppose AB 13, um, and I'm aware of the impact it will have on my parents, my child, and my family. Um, my, grandpa my parents um, are grandparents of two almost 10 grandchildren who are still attending school, and I live in a um, more I live in Oakland, so it's more, you know, it's not really much support in Oakland for children um, at their school. Um, my dad, my, both of my parents, my dad and my mom were recently convicted of these um, related um, felonies, but are released and are out now. And my mom, who dearly loves drawing, coloring, and playing, and 
um, teaching my cousins, my younger cousins, who are um, range from the ages five to nine or to ten. She doesn't. She's not aware of this bill, and she's not aware that she won't be able to volunteer when she's um, willing to. She's not aware that she won't be able to volunteer, and so I'm. I'm more worried. So to the point that this is like a recovery zone for my 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 parents, and to involve their self in my education, my, um, their grandparents, I mean their grandchildren's education. So to me, this will affect myself, my, my family, and my parents because it's a, it's a strong, it's too much of a strong bond that you guys will be breaking between these kids and, and their families. And it's not, it's not that you're, it's, it's not that it's, it's not understandable, but it's not bearable. And something that's not bearable can cause other, you know, other, reactions to this bill, which probably won't be nice in certain communities and areas. So with that, I'm saying and I'm asking that um, you guys consider the fact that it, it's, to me it's not a good idea. It's not, it's, it's just not a good idea. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. You did very good. Thank you. Other witnesses in opposition? Thank you. So good morning, my name is Manuela Fontaine and I am a member of All of Us and None, which is a national organization of people with past convictions who are fighting for the full, restor full restoration of our rights. And I'm, I'm here to help amplify that voice. I'm provided a, 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 try to provide a picture to what we're talking about, the AB 13. And this picture uh, shows, and it's, it's gonna be a, a photo album going around, the people will be impacted. And it's gonna be primarily people of color, my son. Um, and I'm gonna put, a, a number two, he said uh, that five year limit. Well, I got charged with a very serious and violent felony and I got it reduced to a, to, a, to a serious felony. And I had to do three years before I got convicted in the county jail. By the time I got out, I still had three years to do mm -hmm. outside. And I was, and, and if this bill passes, I will not be able to go inside school. Then when my son asked me to help him out for Cinco de Mayo, how will I respond to him? in my county uh, of San Mateo, East Palo Alto, my community has been uh, devastated by mass incarceration. So it's a, it's a fundamental question when a child who right now is in the Spanish immersion program, when I come late to pick him up, he's looking at me sadly on, on, the, on the school window because all the parents have come in to pick up the, and I haven't been there to also, so he can share that. So it's a question that we have to address. And if we want safe communities, I'm, 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 in I'm involved deeply in the community. And if we want safe communities, we need strong families. Without strong families, we won't have strong communities, we will equal safe communities. So this bill is counterintuitive to safe families and safe communities. And I urge and everybody here to please vote no on AB 13. Thank you. Thank you. Other witnesses in opposition? Hi, my name is Karen Shane. I'm from Legal Services for Prisoners with Children in San Francisco. And we believe that this bill is highly discriminatory against people with pasts. And um, as Manuel said, and as Cherie said, we think it's very important that let's let the communities decide. Let's go with local discretion on this issue. And we strongly, strongly urge a no vote. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. Valerie Small Navarro with the ACLU, also in strong opposition. Thank you. Thank you. Jim Lindbergh on behalf of the Friends Committee on Legislation of California in support of formerly incarcerated people, the children of incarcerated parents, in opposition to AB 13. Thank you. Other witnesses in opposition? Good morning. Glenn Backus for Drug Policy Alliance. In opposition, very briefly. Very briefly. Um, amongst those who would be excluded from participating in their children's education would be those who receive probation for a burglary charge involving stealing a bicycle tire from a, a shed or garage. This is a there is already the power for local governments to control their volunteer base to exclude the same parents that are in this bill if local governments so choose, school board so choose, principal so choose. The bill is not needed, and therefore we ask for a no vote. Thank you. Other witnesses in opposition? Let's return it, bring it back to the committee. I have, uh, I'd like the representatives from uh, Palmdale and also from Public Advocate is to come up because I think the critic, one of the critical issues is uh, why do we need st a state action? Palmdale is already doing background checks. You've indicated that. And the question is what do you use that information now with? Why are you coming to us to d 
engage in state action when you're already doing it, and I think the public advocates also have indicated, well, school districts can already do this. What, so the question is, what are you limited now in doing? Mr. Chairman, if I may. Uh, and have you had any problems? The, the district has, the, the Allen Valley in general and, and Palmdale School District in particular right. have very serious drug problems. Every year the district has several dozen instances where people have disqualifying convictions that would prevent them from being employees. Well, so that's not talking that's, about employment though. That includes though among those people, you know, distribution, manufacture, manufacture of hard drugs. I understand, but the right. question to you is you're now doing background checks on volunteers. What do you use that information for? The answer And why are you coming to us to ask us to do something when in fact you're already gathering that data? I just need to understand that. And okay. what and to tell us what you're limited in doing also. Sure. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. It's just really important for us to understand just what's going on out there, and then I'm going to ask the same question to the public advocate. Let me try to do a better job. No, no, it's okay, but just stay focused not on employment, on what you're now, I, I want to volunteer. You do a background check, and you find, oh my gosh, that guy may be a senator and all of that, but look what he has done. <laughs> in that, what would you do with me? There, there is no discretion to prevent you from volunteering under existing law. Education code section. You don't limit where they can volunteer? You don't say, well, if you have someone like me who has had a violent felon or a felony in the last five years, you don't use any discretion in terms of where I'm able to be, where you place me? I suppose there would be some discretion there. What the education code does right now, though, is affirmatively grants you the right to volunteer if you're a parent, even That's if true. you have these convictions. That's true. And so I'm asking you, what do you do, though? And I'm not hearing the answer. What we do is allow the person to volunteer because we must. And in the classroom? Mm -hmm. Okay. Under very close supervision. Okay. Having another adult supervise the volunteer, including you know, when they go to the restroom, not allowing them to do certain things like okay. escort children to the restroom. Um, essentially, we take our limited resources and we use them to supervise the volunteer. Got it. So have you found that you've had any problems? We have not had a volunteer, caught a volunteer trying to deal drugs to a child or give drugs to a child or something uh, like Mr. that. Mr. Chair, if I can certainly, intervene here. Certainly, Mr. S you know, in Senator. Sacramento, we wait until something happens. We know that there is a problem that could exist, that could happen. And so as assemblymen and senators, we wait until something happens that makes this hit the news, and then we write a law. Is that really what we're supposed to be doing? Or should we be looking at a possibility of our most vulnerable population, of our children, and saying, if we did this, we could curtail this? Senator. Public, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, assembly member. Advocates. Liz Public Guillen with Public Chris. Advocates. Districts can already do this. They only need to do it in a non-discriminatory way. So they have the discretion to do this. We don't have any examples of the need for this, but what we do have are stark, living, breathing examples of low-income students, students of co color in school districts, in communities of color, poor communities, and immigrant communities who are failing who desperately need their families to be volunteering. This bill will have a really discriminatory impact on their education. Districts can already do this. Mr. Chairman. Senator Samidian. Well, I think, that's, <clears throat> I think that's a critical part of the conversation. Uh, what I hear from the local folks is that they're worried that if they tried to adopt a policy consistent with the legislation before us, that it would not be um, that it might not be deemed lawful uh, if they tried to take this action unilaterally. Is that is that a correct assessment? Uh, under existing law, the parent has an affirmative right to volunteer. And what we're seeking is a backstop to allow us, under these limited circumstances with the five-year right. washout, to say no, to protect the students, we don't want you in the, in the All right, so the first, the first challenge I'm seeing is we've got a very different set of opinions at the table. We've got one group of folks who are saying, if you want to pass a policy along these lines, go to it. We've got another group of folks saying, 
we're not altogether sure we can do that uh, because such a policy might not be consistent with state law. That's, that's one issue. That's a different issue in my view from the second issue, which is putting that aside, the bill as written essentially requires that this policy be in place in every district in California. And, you know, that's certainly the author's prerogative. We make statewide law here. Um, if they choose to fingerprint, which I'm guessing virtually every district in the state is going to choose to do with respect to their volunteers, uh, I find it hard to imagine that a district, uh, maybe I'm uninformed, but I find it hard to imagine that a district would take in volunteers with no fingerprinting screening at all. So let me start with uh, the assembly member. Does that sound like a fair uh, assessment of what the debate is about? That's at least? absolutely correct. Okay. I, I have to say to um, opponents today, I, you may or may not recall, I voted no the last time this bill was before the Senate uh, in this committee. And uh, I asked at the time if certain lesser offenses, which some people might still deem quite significant, but lesser offenses could be um, eliminated from the bill at that time. And at the time, the author, in consultation with the sponsor, said uh, he wanted the bill to stand. Today, the author is back with a narrower bill. And uh, I, if I ask myself a couple of questions uh, and answers, here's where I get, assembly member. If I ask myself, as between the two competing values of erring on the side of caution to protect kids and wanting kids' parents to be able to volunteer, where do I come down on the question of whether or not folks who have been convicted of Sex offenses, no, serious sex and offense, violent. No, sex offenses are already precluded. That is sex not. Sex offenses, serious and violent felonies, and felonies involving drugs with minors. I, I, I come down, I think most members of the public would say, we think those are serious enough that we are going to come down on the side of, err on the side of caution, notwithstanding our desire to have parents volunteer in schools. If I go out and I ask 500 parents in most communities, how would you feel about having someone convicted of any of those sex offenses, serious and violent felonies, or felonies with drugs and minors volunteering in your kid's classroom? I'm guessing most of them would say, we don't think that's a very good idea. Um, and then finally, while there is the loss of ability for a parent to participate as a volunteer, I want to be very clear, Assemblyman, there's nothing that says the parent can't be on the school campus to pick up their kid. There's nothing that says the parent can't work with their kid on their homework, can't be in touch with the teacher in the classroom to understand what the assignments are and to work with their kids on those assignments, and can't volunteer in other venues, a boys or girls club, for example, uh, who wouldn't be subject to the same kind of limitations. Have I got that right? You've got that correct. Yeah. Then for me, Mr. Chairman, I think the only issue is whether or not this really ought to be state law per se, which is what we've got in front of us, or whether or not it ought to be a st statutorily established opportunity for individual districts, so that if 500 districts wanted to adopt this policy consistent with state law, they could. If 500 districts said, we don't want to adopt that policy and we don't have to, they could. Um, that would be a different way to go. As the author has the bill before us right now, it's, it's clear his, his goal is not only to ensure that districts who want to do this can, but that any district that runs fingerprints uh, has the obligation to follow this uh, as uh, if it were established as state law. So that's the piece that I'm going to keep working through in my mind. Thank you. Senator Price. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Also, I want to thank the uh, the author. I know he's worked hard on this uh, over the past several years. Uh, I uh, I abstained from the bill last year <clears throat> because I thought it was too broad, and you certainly have um, narrowed it down um, uh, considerably. Um, but I'm still not just totally there. Uh, I, I think the uh, concerns raised. Uh, that it would disproportionately impact some communities more is is relevant, um, and I think it's something that uh, that uh, really each individual area should um, be able to decide. And to um, uh, Senator Smithian's point, 
you know, I think it's a, a local decision as opposed to a statewide mandate that it be so. So I'm um, uh, still not able to support it. I, I think you made some tremendous progress. Uh, if we end up holding this bill, I'd, I'd like to be involved in some discussions about how we can tighten it up even further. Uh, certainly appreciate the, 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 uh, the intent and, and share the intent that we want to make sure that our kids have the safest environment possible. Uh, but I think it is a balance that we want to achieve. Thank you. Thank you. If I could respond, Mr. Chair. Oh, you'll get an opportunity in just a second. I just want to see if, if any of the other members wish to ask any questions. Not seeing any, you now have that opportunity to respond and to close, although we will not be taking this up for a vote until we have a quorum. Just a couple of things that have been said. Uh, what I'm getting from the committee and from the opponents is that we don't want any drug charges. Uh, we don't want any narcotics charges. If uh, I was convicted of selling drugs on uh, 10 school campuses, uh, we don't want that charge on there. That's what I'm getting. Uh, because anytime anyone says sexual offender, everyone's alarms go off. Uh, and we know that that brings up that heightened awareness when we say those two words together. When we say selling drugs on campus, or selling drugs to minors or using someone under 14 years of age to sell drugs, uh, we don't get any alarms. We say that that's okay. Uh, I volunteered for nine years in public school. Get my TB test, go through my DOJ, get my sticker on my lapel, and as much as the school districts like to say that there are teachers watching, I get to take children to the bathroom, I get to watch them on the playground, I get to uh, work in the classroom, and uh, because there's one teacher for 32 kids, and there might be two or three volunteers in that classroom. And so we're there to help the kids. Uh, this is brought forward from the fourth biggest school district in the state, Palmdale School District. Not an affluent school district by any means. Uh, about 79% um, free lunch. Uh, very high Hispanic area. Uh, this is not brought forward, as the opponents seem to think, by a white school district that is looking to help out their, uh, that issue. This is an issue where we drop off our children for seven hours a day with strangers. We might know our teacher. We might know the principal, and we might know a couple others. That's it. We drop them off for seven hours. We pick them up after that. We expect them to be safe from everything. That is the one place I would bet if I use the Senator Semidian's uh, group of 500 people to say where are your kids most safe outside of your home or outside of you, where would they be most safe? I bet most would say in the school. I'd hope they're most safe in the school. That's why we brought this forward. That's why we're saying if the school district denies someone, we want them to be able to do that and say that this is what possibly those reasonable people would say are not eligible to volunteer in school. With the five-year washout rate, I think we've made it more than uh, able for these people to come back and volunteer in school. I ask for your eye vote. I, I would just like to ask one question, then you can still close. I get two end. closes? You get the chance to close twice, assembly member. <laughs> Uh, Palmdale has been doing this, and I agree with you, we shouldn't always be just waiting for some incident to happen. That what you're saying is, how do you balance this, and the question really is, someone who has uh, engaged in a crime, who has served their time, has now been released, now wants to volunteer in their child, children, and how do you balance the safety of students versus the, the rights of a family to stay whole and to work together. And should we be doing this as Senator Simidian said, and maybe you can do that, you can answer this question also, and you close, on a statewide basis, when in fact Palmdale has been gathering this data for a number of years, is not just requesting the ability of Palmdale to do it, but to do this statewide without ever having indicated not only that there was some attempt to sell drugs to a child, it, that there's been any problem at all. 
in any way, but after highly watching, closely supervising, there are no problems, and yet we're going to do this statewide. I still have a problem, so I'd like you to be able to address the issue that Senator Simidian has raised, is should we be crafting something that enables Palmdale to have more uh, sec security that they, or, or, or sense of st that they can do what they need, what they feel they need to do versus now doing this blanket statewide through, approach. Through the chair. Uh, yeah. Before we let, because uh, I, I, I know you don't want to have a triple close, so I just, I, I want to uh, wait right. one more time I'm as well. Um, you know, I'm sitting here thinking about this, Senator, and uh, some, excuse me, Assemblyman, and um, when we get a quorum and uh, there's a motion on the bill, I'm going to support your bill today. Uh, I do think you've narrowed it down. And again, understanding, you know, it would be easy if all we had to do was, you know, vote aye on the good stuff and vote no on the bad stuff, and then our jobs would be simple. As I referenced earlier, there are always these competing legitimate interests. And um, in this case, I keep coming back to the question that I asked a few minutes ago and that I, I'm asking myself, which is, you know, let's just say it out loud. Do we think it's a good idea to have folks who are convicted felons for serious or violent offenses, drug charges involving minors, or sex offenses, working as volunteers in a relatively short period of time after their conviction when they've not yet had the opportunity to prove that rehabilitation has taken hold. Do we think it's a good idea for those felons to be on a campus where we have compulsory education and require people to send their kids. And I just can't get myself to say, yeah, I think that's a good idea. And so today, at least, that's going to get me over the threshold of saying not just permissive, but as a statewide standard, I think you've made the case. So it's a, it's a judgment call, and I get that. Uh, but um, that's where I'll be if and when we ever establish a quorum here. So, Mr. Assembly member, you get a chance to have a second close. <laughs> A rare opportunity. It's a rare opportunity. And I appreciate that, Mr. Chair. Uh, we have narrowed this bill down to specific charges that we believe um, that group of parents would say, you know what, that group is the group that we have identified. And so, again, we have not made a specific instance where this has come forward. That doesn't mean there hasn't been a specific instance where a volunteer has come forward with some of these serious violent problems. Um, I think when you see, do see a problem, if you do see a problem in school, and I hope that that never ever happens, but I think if you do, you'll have 10 members write this bill. I ask very close. Thank you. We will not be able to actually take a motion because we're still short one member for a quorum. Assembly member, Thank but you. as soon as we have a quorum, we will take up the bill. <clears throat> Assembly member Huffman, welcome. Welcome, Senator. Mr. Chair, Pleasure are you ready you. for uh, AB 47? We're ready. Terrific. Um, when uh, the legislature passed the race to the top reforms not long ago, it was acknowledged that, acknowledged that we were making some very sweeping changes on a very rushed time frame and that inevitably there would need to be some fine tuning and cleanup legislation. This bill, which is jointly authored by my colleague Julia Brownlee, the chair of the Assembly Education Committee, makes several needed improvements uh, to the Open Enrollment Act. And uh, as many of you know, all of you know, I'm sure, the uh, race to the top legislation required that the Board of Education develop a process to identify low-performing schools that are eligible for open enrollment. And under this new law, the Superintendent of Public Instruction is required to annually develop a list of 1,000 low-performing schools based on API scores. But that process is subject to some very significant constraints. Uh, one of them is that the list cannot include charter schools even though some of the state's lowest performing schools are charters. In fact, about 10% of the schools that would otherwise qualify as lowest performing schools in California are charter schools. And no district is allowed to have more than 10% of its schools on the list. And uh, this process has created some unintended consequences where schools that are clearly not low performing schools 
have made the list because the formula requires the superintendent to pass over other low performing schools uh, and keep looking until the number hits that quota of 1,000. And so we have seen some anomalous results. One example, uh, or for example, we've seen schools with API scores that are near 800, uh, schools as high as decile six, uh, such as two schools in the Alhambra Unified School District that made this low performing schools list. We've also seen schools that were making significant improvement year over year in their API scores, such as San Pedro Elementary in my district, which achieved a 60-point gain from 2009 to 2010. And because of this formula and these unintended consequences, it was triggered as a low-performing school. These are schools that are doing well. Uh, they're not the kind of schools that I think anyone intended uh, for triggering under the Open Enrollment Act, and yet they are triggered. So this bill provides some simple fixes to prevent these type of unintended outcomes. This bill will prohibit a school from being identified as low achieving if either of the following conditions exist. First, if the school has an API score of 700 or above, or second, if the school has a prior year API growth of 50 points or more. You can think of this as safe harbors for schools that are doing well and schools that ought to be left alone. Also, a school under this bill will have to be triggered under the list for two consecutive years. And if a school is a low performing charter school, it gets to be subject to the same trigger uh, for open enrollment as every other public school. Finally, this bill exempts county offices of education, schools for special education from being uh, included on the list. Uh, Senators, I think this is a bill that refocuses the open enrollment law on the schools that it was meant to cover truly low achieving schools, not schools that are doing well and ought to be left alone. It's a bill that is sponsored by the Association of California School Administrators as well as several school districts from around the state. It is supported by dozens of other school districts, teachers organizations, and the state PTA. And I respectfully request your I vote. Thank you. Other witnesses, oh, or not other, just witnesses in support. Sherry Skelly Griffith with the Association of California School Administrators and we are a co-sponsor of the measure um, we believe that this is a modest reform to the Open Enrollment Act, and um, indeed when um, the bill went through the special legislative session, there was great focus on opportunity for parents to make choice uh, in moving to other schools. And while we support that, we do think that there are some flaws in the current statute that this measure addresses. Um, in particular, um, we think it's important that you really use a formula that identifies the lowest performing. Remember in an index model, it's uh, one through 10, and uh, there has to always be the lowest one uh, decile. With a API of under six, uh, 700, which by the way, we believe any school that is below 700 should truly be on this list, and has lacked making growth, we think that's a more appropriate um, formula for the measure. I just have to tell you, um, it was very disheartening. It's, this is one statute that we've heard more from district superintendents and principals around the state than almost any other. Um, and it is because it is disheartening to them, particularly those that applied for the state board waiver, that they do indeed have schools on this list, over 800 on the API, many without schools and program improvement, yet this was a focal point um, with race to the top, the federal funds and they had to seek waivers before the state board. Now, while they were granted those waivers automatically, and the state board members, many of them said that the law was flawed, what we don't want to see is to have these same districts have to go back to the state board year in and year out to seek these waivers. We think it makes more sense that we refine it now. And then finally in the bill with the data requirements, we do think it's important when you enact a new law that you actually do look at the data and see if it is offering the public school choice that you intended with the measure. And then finally with the up to 1,000, we just feel it's important that if you truly identify the lowest performing, it shouldn't matter if that's 600 or 700 or 800. Having something at a cap or a minimum of 1,000 doesn't seem to make sense to us. It's really the lowest achieving that you're targeting. And with that, we encourage your support. Thank you. Other witnesses in support? Uh, Sandy Silverstein, representing the Riverside County School Superintendents. Um, I second everything Sherry had to say. Um, we think this makes the Open Enrollment Act better 
We're not opposed to open enrollment. We think this makes it a better bill because it truly targets the schools it intended to target in the first place. It is a more nuanced definition and that's what we need. Uh, I did want to speak to a comment number five that the staff made mm -hmm. in the analysis with regard to whether or not um, a two-year uh, failure to meet API targets um, it should be uh, part of the definition and we think it absolutely needs to be. Long-term yeah. reform it takes time and it's a process and there can be aberrations from year to year for numerous reasons. Different student incentives used at the local level, different test conditions, changes in population. So we absolutely think that uh, a, any definition of a lowest achieving school should include the um, uh, failure to meet the API at least two years before you make that decision. Thank you. We support Thank the you. bill. I've, are the witnesses in support? Uh, Mr. Chairman and members, Jeff Frost representing the school districts of Marin County and also the California Association of Suburban School Districts. Uh, for all the reasons already uh, stated, we would support the bill. Other witnesses? Debbie, look on behalf of the California State PTA. We also support open enrollment and public choice in the public school system and believe that this measure is critical to give parents the real choice to, for their children the, for the children who are attending low-performing schools to have a real choice about the quality of their education. Urge your eye vote. Erica Hoffman on behalf of the California School Boards Association also in support of the measure. Pamela Gibbs representing the Los Angeles County Office of Education in strong support. Dave Walrath, representing Small School District Association. Just a slight point, because we concur with AXA regarding the 700 with 50 API growth, there will be some school districts that go over the 10% limit, particularly those districts that have five or fewer schools and one of them are identified. They'll be greater, but we believe it is appropriate because of the nature of the new mo model on how you become eligible for open enrollment, that that would still be a case where you, it would be okay to be over the 10%. We are in support of the bill. Thank you. Good morning, Chair and members. Michelle McKay Underwood on behalf of Alhambra Unified, Corona Norco Unified, Ocean View School District, Clovis Unified School District, and the California Interscholastic Federation in support. Good morning. Greg Miner from Public Advocates also in support. Hello, Fatima Segura. On behalf of San, uh, San Bernardino School Districts for Better Schools, we are in support of this bill. Thank you. Pam Bachilla, on behalf of the Alameda County Office of Education and the San Francisco Unified School District in support. Are there any other witnesses in support? Are there witnesses in opposition? Mr. Chairman, Bill Lucia with Ed Voice. We um, have concerns. There are parts of the bill that we don't don't have any problem with and would actually endorse and support, and others that um, we want to bring some points to your attention. Uh, some were addressed in the committee analysis and um, express um, specifically to start out concern with the sunset provision. This is this bill and the measures proof positive that the legislature can come back at any time and revisit um, its previous actions and, and take a look at the program and, and fine tune it. Um, we're uh, specifically to give you a sense we're um, comfortable with the special education and the special schools those are clearly programs are not district where they're districts of residence um, enrollment criteria um, the, the labeling issue was a, a concern that the sponsors have raised um, we actually see that the bill doesn't address that there was a lot of discussion in the regulatory process over at the state board of education um, that uh, in a concern about whether indeed the schools that get put on this open enrollment list are in fact low performing um, the state board in its rulemaking process that are now there are now permanent regulations that have been adopted does not actually even use the word low performing and there was a lot of discussion with OAL about that about whether that was an allowance or not but we'd be fine changing the nomenclature on on the nature of the list um, with the respect to the issue of the charter schools the um, as I understand with the bills that have already gone through this committee and that you're gonna be hearing uh, next week uh, those uh, the, the authors expressed an interest in addressing, as, as we understand it, the ability of a, of a, a 
student that's been enrolled in a low performing charter school that gets closed from not being sent back to even a lower performing public school and not having the ability to go possibly through choice to another district. And so that, that seems like there's you know some reasonableness mm -hmm. to that approach. Um, we do want to point out um, a couple key things with regard to the issue of the um, being on the list a at all. Um, we, we don't know if it's intended or not. We think it's an, uh, not non-intentional, but want to point out to you a circular tautology that exists in the issue of having um, not not be having a placement on the list until you've been on the list for um, two years. So if you if you've never been low performing or whatever you want to call this new category of school, um, then you haven't been on the list. You can't get on, you can't be on there for two years if you haven't been on the list ever. So as in in practice, in the plain English of this statute, this this as drafted. Um, puts a permanent cap on the program for schools that were on the list last fall and this fall before this law would become operative this January 1, and there would never be another school on this list new um, b based on the, the, the literal reading of the statute. Um, with regard to the issue of 700 and 800 and so forth, the proponents, and as the committee analysis points out, have stated that their, their primary concern in the testimony you heard was about the issue of 800. 800 is, is a sensitive point for a lot of school leaders and districts and teachers, certainly because that's the statewide target for the ac academic performance index. And so while we understand that and we've worked with the administration and, and others in um, working through some of the waiver requests at the State Board of Education, the, the focus of attention there has been on the issue of the 800 calibration and that being the statewide academic target. Um, we, we would encourage you to look carefully at this because even those schools that were above 800 had over 6,000 students in subgroups that had not been met the 800 target and many might right off the top think well those were just special ed kids but it turns out only 46 out of the 6,000 kids were sport special ed kids the remainder were um, students who were high and reduced free and reduced price lunch high poverty African American, Latino, and English learner kids that w would all under that policy, even if the bar were at 800 and otherwise exempt, there would be nearly 6,000 kids that would not have the opportunity for open enrollment and go to another public school, another bricks and mortar unionized public school in another district that's willing to serve them. So we think that it's clear that if you're talking about 6,000 kids with the ones that we already know are, have met the 800 target, it's not just tens of thousands, but hundreds of thousands of kids in these categories that would not have an opportunity for open enrollment. Thank you. Uh, before we go on, uh, let, will the secretary, we have a quorum. Will the secretary please call the roll? Lowenthal? Here. Lowenthal? Here. Runner? Alquist? Blakesley? Hancock? Here. Hancock here. Huff? Here. Huff here. <coughs> Lou? Here. Lou here. Price? Here. Price here. Semidian? Median here, Vargas. We have a quorum. We have a quorum. Uh, Senator Huff, I, let, I think we've heard all the opposition witnesses and opposition witnesses in support. Let's bring it back, Senator Huff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, being a joint author of this <laughs> bill last year, I have a few comments and a few questions um, because I feel that your bill does fix some areas, but it's I've often said we fix dogs and cats, but they're never the same. <laughs> and I'm concerned this is going in that direction too. It, AB 47 was uh, a bipartisan agreement between the governor, the speaker, the pro tem, and respective uh, Republican caucuses, and you even supported it. It was a Huff uh, Huffman collaboration. You know, it was a wonderful thing when it works. <laughs> and, and maybe we'll have an opportunity to tie in our fly cast off later today. Right now, I have some concerns. I, I think it undermines what we were trying to do in enabling parents. And frankly, it, it guts it by putting a sunset date on there. It terminates program, because then it's got to come up for review. That's, um, I don't have a problem reviewing things, but sunsetting something that was problematic to a difficult process to get through in the first place doesn't give me concern. Um, Parents have hardly had an opportunity to hear about the program, and then we're already altering it and then putting a sunset date on it, trying to repeal it. So my question is, if you're a high-performing school, what are we afraid of? That's not a question for you. It's a rhetorical question right now. No parent's going to leave the district if you're a good school. So, And I recognize there's some on there, and I'll address that a little later on. But 
So the question is, what problem are we solving here? Um, because students would still be going to a higher performing school even if they were at that arbitrary 800 level. Um, open enrollment is not punishment and it shouldn't be seen as punishment for school districts. It's an opportunity for kids and parents. It's an opportunity for the kids to go to a better school. It's an opportunity for the parents to get the best education they can in the public school setting that is within their grasp and their reach. Um, Open Enrollment Act is not designed and shouldn't be perceived as a punitive program. It's better opportunities for kids. When it was first introduced, and mind you, it was a tortuous process that went through, you may recall it, but it was intention to create a statewide open enrollment program, and it got negotiated into 1,000 schools. And then on top of that, it got negotiated into just 10% from any school district, and that's where we ended up with the unintended consequences because we didn't have just the lowest performing schools. We supported those amendments because it was still better to be giving opportunities to the lowest 10%. It wasn't obviously as broad as we wanted, but even now we're narrowing it because you have, and now we will segue into the question. Um, the law says that the superintendent shall make an open enrollment list of up to 1,000 schools. So the question is, would one school qualify as up to? I, I think that would uh, be a surprising outcome. But Senator. Uh, possible. We, but we are talking about logical tautologies here today. So I, I guess you could say that it's theoretically possible in the real world. Um, I, I think that's not possible. Being a member of the minority party that just had a budget passed without one single Republican vote or being involved in the process, I have to look at every possible outcome. And so one or two or five would certainly fly in the face of what was being attempted on a bipartisan, you know, move last year to help, help turn our school system around. I think we all recognize it needs to do better. I, I just, I feel passionately that this is actually going to gut something that is just barely a fledgling getting on its legs. I, and we recognize some things we've got to change. And I think that we should. Um, so... The 10 percent cap on schools is um, it there's a fixed number of elementary middle and high schools required by the bill that we did and that was part of the unintended consequence also because it forced them into a matrix that we couldn't get to the lower performing so the Department of Education uh, ran some numbers from my office and they created an open enrollment list without taking into consideration how many elementary middle or high schools are on the list and you know the list they created didn't have one school with 800 on it. And why couldn't we just take an amendment like that and let the process work and then get the truly lowest performing schools on this? Is that an amendment you would take and just focus on that? Well, Senator, I appreciate the question. I, I cannot uh, take that amendment. This bill started out, I, I do wanna, want you to know, uh, removing the 10% cap on any school district. and and I felt perfectly fine with that, but a lot of other folks did not. A lot of other people thought that more than 10% did uh, create special burdens and stigmas for certain districts. So like the original legislation itself, this is a compromise. And uh, the 10% cap was something that I had to live with. So if you've got that 10% cap in, the question is how do you build out something that is more flexible and workable that gets, I think, to the original intent, which was not create open enrollment for every single school in California. Uh, as much as I think you may have wanted that and you see that as a, a, a virtuous thing, others did not. And so the deal was this would be about low achieving schools. And I think given the compromises I've had to make and the constraints that we're under, this is an appropriate uh, mechanism. Next question, why set the benchmark at 700? Why so low when 875 is the magic number? talked to a lot of school administrators, a lot of educators about that, and the feeling was that if you're above 700, uh, that's an appropriate safe harbor where you should not be considered a low achieving school. With all respect, many parents would not see that as safe harbor, particularly when they have schools near them that they could take their child to. And so if they did fall within what was mathematically without some of these artificial constructs we put in the way, the lowest performing schools, and, and even there they fell within an 800, 
If they were in the lowest 10, why wouldn't we want? Because that would be the kind of market force that would help drive up the performance of schools and give them reasons to do a better job. I, I would love to be there, and I agree with some of the testimony against it. There's many parts of this that are supportable, but when you have up to, that's probably the kiss of death for me, because up to gives me no comfort. We'll get anywhere near a thousand, keeping in mind that was a negotiated thousand I didn't like in the first place. So I'm definitely gonna like, not going to like taking it down. But, um, anyway, I appreciate you trying to fix it. Uh, I can't support it. No. Thank you. Well, Senator, I would just say uh, the, the trade off there is that if you've got the 10% cap and you've got a thousand as a quota as opposed to uh, an up to goal, uh, you are left with this constant drive to identify schools whether they're low achieving or not. And that's sort of the unintended consequences, uh, unintended consequence that I think everybody, or let me say most of us, I supported the, the legislation as well. We never thought uh, that this would be an ongoing search that passes over truly low achieving schools to find high achieving schools just because the quota is driving us to that. Thank you. Senator Sumidian. Well, let me, let me just pick up. I think the point that uh, some of a member just made is, is, is key, is that we, we never anticipated that we would pass over low-achieving schools by whatever definition uh, in order to capture high-achieving schools by whatever definition. Uh, so I'm, I'm with you. <coughs> I'm with you there. Um, and I think, uh, to Senator Huff's point, the, the goal isn't, in my judgment, is not about 1,000 schools. It's not about 10 percent. The goal of the measure that I ultimately supported after some very lively Senate education hearings and some amendments that the author agreed to take, the goal is to say, if the system's failing your kid and the system continues to fail your kid, at some point we have to say, you get to walk away and have a better opportunity somewhere else. I think that was the one thing that people could come together on. Um, I think you've done a nice job, for the most part, in my judgment, on dealing with those unintended consequences. But I, I may surprise both you and Senator Huff. Uh, I, too, am quite troubled by the sunset date. Um, I appreciated your willingness to sort of try and get past that 10 percent threshold. Uh, and um, I, I actually I probably would have been sympathetic to Senator Huff on that. You know what? If the system's not serving a kid well, and that appears to be perpetual, then, you know, if it was 15 percent of the schools, I, I'm not sure why 10 percent was a magic number. But again, you pointed out, Assembly Member, and I'm going to try and hold you to these words now, a minute ago that people made the case and you were ultimately persuaded the deal was, that that was the deal. Well, the deal was that there wasn't a sunset in the last bill. The deal was that after all of the push and shove, and there was a lot of it on the bill, that we were going to try and make this model work. I think it's great that you're back. I, I applaud your courage even as I question your judgment in taking this one on. Uh, I think it's great that you're back to try and deal with these unanticipated, uh, unanticipated consequences. But I, I think we ought to call the sunset what it is. I think the sunset is here because there are people who hope the program will just go away uh, at that point. And that's not something that I'm willing to support. So absent an amendment to remove the sunset, I will be a no vote on the bill as much as I applaud your work uh, on the rest of the bill. Um, I also think it presents some practical challenges, quite frankly. And maybe there's a solution to this that I just haven't sort of thought through. But not clear to me what happens to a kid who has exercised his right to leave a district, go to another district, is there in the year 2014 and then discovers a year later that the authorizing statute has been sunsetted and no longer exists. Does that kid have to go back to the district that he left pursuant to state law um, and leave the higher performing district to go back? So that's, that's a practical consideration. But even if that wasn't a practical consideration, the uh, and I'm someone who, who has taken sunsets in a number of my own bills. I think there are times when it's appropriate. But in this case, the deal that was struck, or as you said, the deal was, was that we were going to have those compromises, but then that was the deal. So I, I'm going to have to be a no vote, and I'm sorry about that, unless there's a willingness to take the sunset out. Uh, I think we ought to let this opportunity um, play itself out, see if we can't make it work for kids and for districts. I was a strong advocate of three amendments, which ultimately the authors agreed to take for receiving districts, because I thought 
it was a false promise to kids to say you can leave if we couldn't make it work at the receiving end. Right. The authors took those uh, amendments uh, uh, under some duress, I think it's fair to say, uh, but that was the, the, the deal we had. And when the State Board of Education last year tried to push those amendments aside, I was pretty noisy about saying, hey, we had a deal. And now when we try and sort of um, come back and say, actually, we want the program to disappear in five years, I'm, I think I have to be equally noisy and say, uh, that's, that's, that wasn't the deal either. So I guess my question uh, buried in all of that uh, reminiscence, uh, Mr. Chairman, is, Assembly Member, are you prepared to remove the sunset date from the bill today? I knew there was a question. That's the question. <laughs> Senator, I'm uh, prepared to uh, think hard and count heads, and I would like to have a bill that uh, lives another day. So uh, if if that is what I need to do in this committee, I, I don't think that does great violence to the uh, the reforms that we're, or the, the fine tuning I would suggest that we're making. And I think your point about trying to hew as closely as possible to the original deal while fixing unintended consequences is a good one. That's what I set out to do at the beginning. So, um, you know, if it's the pleasure of this committee that, uh, that I take that amendment uh, here and now, I'm, I'm prepared to do that. As I've listened to this discussion, uh, I have become convinced also, uh, although I was prepared to support the bill before with the sunset, I do, I do not really see the benefit also of the sunset. Uh, and I would support both, I believe, Senator Huff and Senator Simidian in suggesting that you do take the sunset out. I assume that's going to get me a yes vote from Senator Huff here if I do that. I think that's a great question back, Senator Huff. That removes one of my major concerns, Thank and I you. would appreciate that. Thank you so much. But only one of my major concerns, and if you would uh, take the other amendment home. I suggested, you would definitely have my vigorous support. Always trying. It will get you a yes vote from me, Assembly Member. And so I will. I will. I will, in your close, I will, if you wish to take the sunset out, you will do that and we will accept that as an author's amendment. Is there any other, Senator Hancock, or Senator, maybe you might want to. I have thought the bill that? is an excellent bill. I do too. I'm prepared to support it today. Um, with the sunset, with a longer sunset, 10 years, uh, frankly, essentially a four-year sunset now doesn't give very much time for the program to play out. Um, I have some other questions as well, but in general, I think it's moving in the right direction where we are not, we really are focusing on truly low achieving schools and trying to make sure that parents and children have a choice and that we aren't penalizing schools that in fact have very adequate or even high achievement. Senator Hancock, are you saying also, I just want to be clear that if, if Assemblymember Huffman removes the sunset, you will still support the bill? Thank you. Is there any other questions by any other members? Assembly member, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate this uh, discussion very much. Uh, I will take uh, as an amendment today uh, the removal of the sunset, and we'll keep working on this. Uh, respectfully request your I vote. Thank you. In that case, I'll move the bill, Mr. Chair. The bill's been moved by Senator Simidian, as amended, do pass as amended, to appropriations. To appropriations. Secretary, please call the roll. Lowenthal? Aye. Lowenthal, aye. Runner? Alquist? Blakesley? Hancock? Aye. Hancock, aye. Huff? Reluctantly, no. Huff, no. Lou? Price? Aye. Price, aye. Simidian? Aye. Simidian, aye. Vargas? The bill has four votes, not sufficient for passage, but we'll place it on call for the absent members. Thank you. Assembly Member Portantino. Welcome. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Um, AB 160 uh, actually represents a five-year journey to bring concurrent enrollment or to expand concurrent enrollment opportunities between California high schools and California community colleges. Uh, I will be taking the suggested amendments from the committee staff and we've been working very closely with the Chancellor's Office and we've taken a number of amendments to uh, work closely with the Chancellor's Office again to bring this closer to actually becoming California law. As we know, there are restrictions currently to concurrent enrollment opportunities. Basically what this bill allows is high schools and community colleges to negotiate their own agreements and define those terms themselves. It also removes the principal's okay for high school students who want to take career technical classes throughout the state of California. Uh, concurrent enrollment is an opportunity to help the student across the entire spectrum those students who want to go into the workforce could have those opportunities to expand those uh, chances of going out and becoming productive Californians and those students who want academic challenges have the opportunity to go take academic classes. We're pleased to have worked with the chair and the committee and respectfully ask for an I vote. Witnesses in support. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, um, my name is Marlene Garcia. I'm with the Community College Chancellor's Office, and we are in support of the bill. We think that a concurrent enrollment has been around for a number of years, but we think this bill adds greater focus and coordination in the program that will help strengthen the concurrent enrollment relationship between K-12 and community college. So we think the partnership that's um, that's uh, part of this bill is, is a, a significant improvement. The second provision that uh, removes the, per the principal's permission for students pursuing career technical ed um, courses, what it does is it shifts the approval or, or, or recommendation to the community college career technical ed department for them to determine whether the student, there's capacity to handle the student. And this would happen outside the partnership, so any student in California would be able to pursue this if they go to the community college and get that approval from the career technical ed department. So we think that this brings um, significant focus to the bill and urge your support. Thank you. Other witnesses in support? Cindy Hillary on behalf of the Regional Council of Rural Counties. We're in support. In rural areas, it is very difficult for schools to have higher level classes as well as career technical classes when the schools are so small and have so few resources. The opportunity to take advantage of courses in um, community colleges is ideal for rural areas and we're in strong support of this access for our students. Thank you. Erica Hoffman on behalf of the California School Boards Association also in support of the measure. This will strengthen that connection for those students who do need the training, especially in career tech, to make that connection in order to receive the certification. And we appreciate the authors carrying the bill. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and Committee Bonnie Slauson representing the Community Co College League and on behalf of the League we express our support. Concurrent enrollment has provided an effective means to provide advanced coursework to students um, that especially in your rural areas do not have access to education. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you Chair. Um, members Mark McDonald on behalf of the Kern, Los Angeles, Peralta, San Jose Evergreen and West Kern Community College Districts uh, appreciate appreciate the committee analysis and the author's um, um, persistence with this bill. This has long been um, one of our goals and m most studies that you see, studies coming out, look at the sooner that students are engaged on a college campus, the more likely they are to move directly to college and the more likely students are to move directly to college, the more likely they are to complete. We think this is an essential component to increasing completion at community colleges, and we would urge your support. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any witnesses in opposition? Members of the committee? I, said, I just have not even a question. I'd really like you to kind of elaborate a little bit on the adoption of, of uh, the ability to create uh, the uh, concurrent enrollment needs a public process it, and you have accepted that as an amendment. Can you describe exactly what that public process is? Well, I think the, the committee staff made a very good point. It's one thing to, to put in place this program. It's another thing for the public to be aware of it. And so to have the local entities who are entering into the partnerships to then uh, agendize it and do public outreach um, is an important 
component because oftentimes we you know change laws or we create things but no one knows about it mm -hmm. so uh, that was one of the issues that the staff brought up and we think that's a very good idea I, yeah I also think that on the other side that the public process it forces both especially the community college to deal with what its capacity is right. also and and what what its priorities right. are and in a public hearing as they want wish to move towards concurrent mm -hmm. enrollment if there are any issues at that time that might occur regarding its ability to serve its other students will be addressed at that moment. And I think that's critical that whenever we make changes like this, and I totally support these changes, that they be seen in the context of other services and pro educational programs that already exist and have that public forum or hearing to be able to discuss if there will be or could be impacts. And I think that's also sort of the, the beauty of what we're doing here is that it's empowering the locals mm -hmm. to, to do what they need to do to meet the demands of the local high schools, the local community college districts, which are going to be different from parts of each part of the state. That's right. And so I think that sort of makes this even work better than trying to say, here's what we want you to do. I, well, I do support this even more better bill. Now, Thank you. <laughs> I'm from New Jersey and you're from New York. That's exactly <laughs> right. Is there any other question, Senator Smitty? As someone who was born in New Jersey and baptized in New York, I'm prepared to move the bill. <laughs> Thank you. Senator I, was not at your, Senator, I was not at your baptism. Senator Smitty moves the even more better bill. As, as amended, yes. two approves. Would you like to close? Um, I just thank the, the support that came out. Obviously, uh, this is something that truly will help the student across the spectrum and across the different geographical needs of the state of California, and in particular, the, the rural student who does not have the same opportunities that the suburban student has to get uh, advanced placement classes. They'll be able to compete when they apply right. to the UCs, and certainly those students who want to go into the workforce will have a quicker, more efficient, and better for the California economy opportunity to do that. So I respectfully ask for an I vote. Thank you. Thank you. Is, will the secretary please call the roll? Lowenthal? Aye. Lowenthal, aye. Renner? Elquist? Blakesley? Hancock? Huff? Aye. Huff, aye. Blue? Aye. Blue, aye. Price? Aye. Price, aye. Simidian? Aye. Simidian, aye. Vargas? Six, 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 I don't know there's six people. Aye. That bill has five votes. We're going to place it on call for the absent members. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Chair. Is Assemblymember Lara here? No. Assemblymember Bonilla, welcome. AB 224. Good morning. Good morning. Very happy to be here. Thank you very much. After last night, we're happy to be here too. <laughs> yes. It's my pleasure, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, to present AB 224, which most of you have voted on probably previously in its uh, previous version, which was then AB 400 by Speaker Nunez. AB 224 complements the efforts to reduce the high number of school dropout rates and expand access and demand for career technical education and A through G courses. Most Californians assume that we're holding our public schools accountable for graduation rates and for achieving college and workforce readiness. And that was the original intent of the 1999 Public School Accountability Act. However, our current academic performance in index system still only uses standardized test scores for the basis of our entire accountability system. AB 224 would require the Superintendent of Public Instruction to incorporate in additional uh, measurements of performance into the API for grades 8 through 12. It would include high school graduation rates, rates of students completing an A through G course of study, rates of students completing a career technical education course of study, uh, which might include the job core standards. Uh, and I think that as we look realistically at what we're um, seeing in our educational system, when you find out that the California State University is reporting that over 50% of our students who meet their admission standards, which are test scores for the most part, are actually in need of remediation. 
and not able to complete college level coursework without that remediation and are not proficient in either math or uh, English, we realize that we need to do more on the accountability end around college uh, preparation. Uh, this bill would task the existing Public School Accountability Act Committee to provide the recommendations on implementing these additional indicators for middle school and junior high. AB 224 ensures that the original intent for the API to consist of a variety of indicators is fulfilled and that we would get a more accurate um, reading on our, school, our students' performance. API indicators were never meant to be engraved in stone. Accountability is a process of continual improvement to move towards and develop a robust system of accountability. As a society, there's much more we value from our public education and school system than just test scores. An improved accountability system reflects the importance of balancing test scores with other measurable student outcomes. And I do have some um, supporters with me. Terry Burns on behalf of California Association of Leaders of Career Preparation. We're very much in support of this effort. As you know, education finance has been very, very thin the last few years. School districts have been asked to make decisions on what programs to keep, what programs not to keep. There's also been an emphasis over the last few years to build up career technical education programs recognizing that those are costlier programs often to implement. It costs more to buy an auto lift than to buy a textbook. Given the choices school districts are having to make with tough funds, they're recognizing that what they measure, what they're measured on, is what they're going to have to keep. The current system does not measure schools on how well they prepare students for the workforce. It measures them on English language arts and mathematics. Pretty much that's it. And so our ability to include other factors in the accountability system will help protect our recent efforts to support career technical education programs in our schools. Mr. Uh, yes, go on. Mr. Chair, members of committee, Chris Walker on behalf of the California Association of Sheet Metal Air Conditioning Contractors. I'm very much interested in bringing career technical education back into our schools. It's not a shock to us that despite the emphasis that this body has had to restore CTE, that the numbers of CTE courses and enrollments are this year the lowest in California history and continuing to drop. Uh, I'd like to associate my comments with, with Ms. Burns. You get what you measure. Uh, if we're not measuring uh, preparation for, for the workforce, the schools are not going to provide it. The taxpayer and businesses in the communities need to have transparency from any accountability system for schools. Right now, there is no transparency. School A and School B, both in program improvement, School A gets rid of all their art classes, their career technical education classes, their foreign language classes, some of their college prep classes, and focuses on the API scores, raises their scores by 20 points. School B maintains their career technical education, makes the difficult choices, maintains their art programs, maintains some of their college prep programs, and only raises their API scores by 10. What the taxpayer and businesses see by the ind index today is that school A is superior to school B. And I think most people would say quite the opposite. School B did a lot more than school A. Right now, taxpayers and businesses are being blinded by the reality of what's going on in our schools. We need this bill. Mr. Chair, Senators, Fred Jones on behalf of the California Business Education Association. I associate myself with all the previous comments. Uh, every real estate agent knows what their local school's API scores are. None of them knows what goes into API. So it's important to value school B as much as other schools, those schools that support preparing their kids for life after school. Thank you. Ernie Silva, on behalf of Sciatec High Schools, uh, we appreciate working with uh, Assemblymember Bonilla and will continue to do so. Uh, we're, our, our, our issue, she mentioned the job core standards. You'll remember when Senator Steinberg's bill came through, there was an amendment taken so that, that broadened the types of career tech programs that are included, and we look forward to working with her to um, accomplish that here, too. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Chris Reef on behalf of State Superintendent of Public Construction, Tom Torlickson. The superintendent does not have an official position on this measure, but has definitely been engaged with the assembly member, very much appreciates many of the conversations he has had with the assembly member regarding this issue. As you know, the legislature is considering, currently considering many measures to um, take our accountability system to the next generational level. And we certainly encourage the committee to uh, move this bill out of com uh, committee so that we can continue to have this conversation on a much more uh, comprehensive level. Thank you very much. Other witnesses? Are there any witnesses in opposition? Mr. Chair and members, Sherry Griffith with the Association of California School Administrators. We actually have an opposing us amended position on the measure, and we've been working with the author and very much appreciate um, her efforts to address our concerns. Um, first, we want to be on the record uh, strongly supporting multiple measures, particularly for the secondary level. Um, we think that this is a long time in coming, so we do appreciate the focus on college and career ready. Um, our concerns, however, really stem from a, a couple of areas of process. One is that we feel the implementation timeline is much too short and to some extent premature. Um, we still have to work on our Common Core implementation and our STAR reauthorization, which we think will be front and center in the next couple of years. So we have requested that the author consider a date that's further out. Um, we've suggested at a minimum 2014, 2015. Secondly, in regards to workforce outcomes, while we think that data is interesting and important, um, we very much are concerned about the concept that we encapsulate that into the API and that somehow school districts who have done their job in graduating students with a full diploma would then be held accountable to the workforce choices made by students once they graduate. We think that would be a very difficult thing to incorporate into the API. Having the data would be helpful for policymaking, um, but we think that would be hard to hold districts accountable to those choices of students once they graduate. Um, third, there's some technical language regarding the role of the superintendent versus the state board. Um, it says that they will consult with the state board. We believe that the state board should make the final decisions on API matters. Um, and then uh, finally, we think there are some additional indicators for college and career ready that should be included. Um, the EAP, which is the test that students take that allows them um, the entry into the CSU. We think that would be a wonderful uh, uh, formula to include as well. If those concerns can be addressed in the future, we will be happy to remove our opposition. Thank you. Are there any members of the committee who wish to ask any questions? Senator Huff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I certainly applaud multiple measures. I am concerned about non-academic multiple measures in this. I do appreciate the career tech in trying to have some way to score that. I'm not sure diluting API is, is the way to go about doing that. 42% of the students entering the CSU in the fall of 2009 were proficient in both English and math. That tells us that there's probably a great inflation going on, so just completing a course doesn't really hit to the effect, are they actually learning something? Are they learning critical knowledge that will help them carry on in, in some kind of a future uh, career? So. Um, enrolled and completed to me are fuzzy. So it's objective, but it doesn't really get to the core of are they ready for college, are they ready for the workforce? And so uh, I actually like some of the suggestions that were made with the EAP and other ways to do it. But the way this is scored right now, I wish we could find a different way to uh, score CTE courses outside of this um, rather than including it in here. Thank you. Any other questions? Assemblymember, I, I too, like Senator Huff, applaud you for doing multiple measures. I think this is a major step forward. I am somewhat troubled, not by your bill. I think your bill helps us move forward. I am some, somewhat troubled in listening to the background, to hearing that really we're not preparing students for careers. We're not preparing, you mentioned when you first started, 50 percent need remediation. What are we preparing students for? I mean, there's quite an indictment that we're not preparing students for anything. And what we're measuring in high school has little relationship to either 
predicting how one does in college, all it does, no matter how well you do on these measures in high school, you still need remediation. And so w w w how do we narrow this gap? I wasn't sure if it was a rhetorical question. No, <laughs> I'm not, and I think that's a very, and now we're going to have multiple, maybe, and I think this helps us move in that direction to get more accurate it kinds does, of and measures. And I'm very supportive of yeah. but the, and, and when I'm troubled, it's not about your bill. Well, and, and, and I'm troubled too as a high school teacher who uh, recently taught 12th grade English. And uh, I think that um, what we've seen with the focus of API has generally been good. We have seen a responsiveness. And right. I think that's what we're trying to do here is say because it has moved a focus and it has actually moved, I believe, a, a direction towards improvement, mm -hmm. what we're trying to do then is is target some other things that you just raised. Um, what are we really hoping to achieve beyond just the performance within that K-12 system and, and get more, um, uh, I guess, uh, improved performance by putting in these other measures? So I think the API has been successful and we need to build on that. And that was the original intent was that it would be broadened to look at other measurements mm -hmm. that we want to, to look at. So I think it's a wonderful opportunity to um, focus uh, on these issues where we see the deficiency and then um, through the committee and the work and the superintendent say how can we now get the rest of the improvement that we really need. Good. Is there a motion on the bill? The bill's been moved by Senator Liu. I believe it. Do pass to appropriations. Would you like to close? I just respectfully ask for your I vote and thank you so much for your consideration today. Thank you. Secretary, please call the roll. Lowenthal? Aye. Lowenthal, aye. Renner? Alquist? Lakesley? Hancock? Huff? No. Huff, no. Lou? Aye. Lou, aye. Price? Aye. Price, aye. Semidian? Aye. Semidian, aye. Vargas? You have four votes. We're going to place that on call. You need six. We're going to place that on call for the absent members. Thank you. Thank you. I have one more bill. I don't know. If yes, you, want you me do. To you do have it now or sit back down? Yes, <laughs> AB 339. Yes. Thank you very much. I think this is uh, very straightforward. Um, and I would like to say, Mr. Chair and members, that I would accept the committee's suggested amendments cited on page three, um, comment number four of the analysis, and the amendments add a sunset date of January 1, 2017. AB 339 reinstates the statutory authority regarding social content review that sunsetted on January 1, 2011. The bill would require the State Board of Education to once again enact a process to govern the social content review of instructional materials outside of the primary adoption process, and it allows a fee to be charged to cover this cost. Without this bill, local school districts could be left to conduct their own costly review of instructional material for out-of-cycle social content. Not only will this place an additional burden on our local school district, but it also could create the possibility of inconsistencies in social content from district to district. Uh, with me today is Janice Warden-Washington from the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tom Torlickson, who's the sponsor of this bill. And also here today is Tom Adams, Director of Standards, Curriculum, Frameworks, and Instructional Resource Division at CDE to answer any technical questions that you may have. Witnesses in support. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. Janice Warden on behalf of the State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tom Torlickson, who is the sponsor. And I would just like to also include that the social content reviews ins ensure that the non-adopted instructional materials used in California's classrooms accurately portray cultural diversity, constructively demonstrate the contribution of minority groups, and make certain that the materials do not contain inappropriate references to commercial brand names, products, and corporate or company logos. Thank you so much. Other witnesses? Erica Hoffman on behalf of the California School Boards Association and for the reasons mentioned and ensuring that there are appropriate instructional materials in the school, we do support the measure. Other witnesses? Are there any witnesses in opposition? Assembly member, I think it's a straightforward bill. I, I, my only 
issue is that we've already heard a bill that's quite similar to this bill, but a little different, and that was SB 302 by Senator Yee. I strongly encourage the two of you to work together to figure out, you know, wh which, the, which of the components will be in one bill and which will be in the other bill or whatever you decide to do. Yes, and we plan to do that. Thank Good. you. Is there a motion on the bill? The bill's been moved by Senator Liu. Uh, do pass as amended. Secretary, please call the roll. Lowenthal? Aye. Lowenthal, aye. Runner? Alquist? Blakesley? Hancock? Huff? No. Huff, no. Lou? Aye. Lou, aye. Price? Aye. Price, aye. Smidian? Aye. Smidian, aye. Vargas? Bill has four votes. We'll place it on call for the absent member. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. I think Assemblymember Laura is here. Welcome. We're going to go back to AB 165. Senator, how are you? I'm doing fine. We had a tough time starting up the hearing this morning after last night, but besides that, we're all doing okay. We're now in, we're now just rolling along. <laughs> Let's hear that. Uh, Senator uh, and members, uh, I bring to you AB 165. Um, you know, we often say in, in this building, uh, we were elected, uh, when we were elected, when we were elected, we swore to uphold the California Constitution, and today we have that opportunity to do just that. The California Constitution was amended in 1879 to ensure that our students receive a free public school education. Yet, despite this long history of free public schools, students are being charged for textbooks, instructional materials, and even, in some instances, fees for simply enrolling in core academic courses. Um, some examples are as follows. Uh, in, Ir in an Irvine school, um, a student was being charged $150 for an AP biology course and AP chemistry course. In another school in Folsom, they were charging $40 for a nutrition class and 16 to 18 dollars for foreign lang uh, language course. Another school required the purchase of a hundred dollar uh, calculator for a math class. Last September, the ACLU filed a lawsuit on behalf of students and revealed dozens of school districts that were openly charging fees for academic courses. One of the student plaintiffs was forced to go weeks without a required workbook for her Spanish class because her parents couldn't afford it. Eventually, the student was able to find a copy through the school library, but not before becoming the last student in the class to receive the book. The law needs to provide clear guidance for all schools. Uh, AB 165 requires existing accountability measures to provide students and families with the means to identify and prevent and address any unconstitutional fees. To be very clear, AB 165 does not prevent voluntary donations or fundraising for extracurricular activities like band, which I'm very proud to be a former band geek myself, uh, <laughs> and actually a cheerleader, varsity cheerleader, um, sports and arts and music programs in our schools. We cannot continue this pay to learn system in our public schools. Free public schools are the heart of our democracy and promising, and promising the opportunity for all regardless of their economic status. I ask for your support today to ensure that we maintain our commitment to making our Constitution's free school guarantee meaningful for all students. I respectfully ask for your I vote. Uh, witnesses in support. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Sanders. Uh, my name is Brooks Allen. I'm the Director of Education Advocacy for the American Civil Liberties Union of Southern California. Uh, the ACLU of California is sponsoring Assemblymember Laura's AB 165 because we are seeking to ensure that all students receive the free education guaranteed by our state constitution since 1879. In the history of our nation, no civil rights victory is more universally hailed today than those that protect students from being denied equal educational opportunity based on the color of their skin, or being denied equal educational opportunity based on the color of their skin or the financial means of their parents. Free public schools are the mechanism by which the American dream is made accessible to all students, regardless of class or social status. 
California's free school guarantee has been repeatedly highlighted and reaffirmed by statutes, regulations, and state Supreme Court decisions over the course of the last 130 plus years. Yet students across California have been required to pay for core instructional materials, textbooks, workbooks, um, assigned novels, as Assembly Member uh, Laura emphasized, even to pay fees for essentials such as lab science classes or to even register for classes. Uh, the ACLU identified dozens of school districts across the state this past fall that were openly listing such unconstitutional fees on their websites. And recently, UCLA's Institute for Democracy, Education and Access released a study in which 19%, 19% of surveyed high school principals reported that their schools have, become, have begun requiring students to pay for instructional materials. AB 165 will make the free school guarantee meaningful in all schools for all students consistent with the best practices already in place in most schools. We respectfully ask for your support. Thank you. Other witnesses in support. Good, after Good afternoon. Lynn Fox on behalf of the California Federation of Teachers here in support and asking for your I vote for what we think is a very important bill, ensuring access to public education for all students. Uh, we support the fundraising activities that remain legal and viable way to raise money for some of the other activities but very, feel very strongly that the Constitution needs to be the uh, in, enforced in this case. Thank you. Debbie, look, in, on behalf of California State PTA, we are committed to ensuring that all students, that the guarantee for in the Constitution of access to a free public education for all students is upheld. All children need to have the rights to equal opportunities to develop and reach their maximum potential. Well, we recognize the inadequacy of school funding and that these are difficult and desperate times for our schools. We cannot ignore the law and the, and the negative impacts of oppose, imposing student fees on our neediest students. We urge your I vote. Other witnesses. Dale Shimasaki with the Association of American Publishers. Uh, we are in support of the bill. Uh, there is a separate section in the California Constitution that provides that instructional materials be provided free of charge to students. And we believe that that provision should be adhere to and enforced. Are there any other witnesses in support? Are there any witnesses in opposition? Mr. Chairman, members, Jeff Frost representing the California Association of Suburban School Districts. We've uh, been in opposition to this bill for some time uh, and have been working to try to become unopposed, but we're not there yet. Um, the issue that remains for us um, and that I've had conversations with the author and the sponsor about is in the section related to pupil fees, um, there is a discussion about what we have sort of euphemistically termed other entities, which are um, not the school itself, uh, or the school district itself, but uh, booster clubs, support groups, um, other entities, could even be a child care center that is on campus. The, the question is, how do you define these other entities to ensure that legitimate uh, donations and other fundraising capability that is not an illegal fee is still allowed? The, the problem for my clients and for the communities within those school districts is that there's a lot of confusion about what a booster group can or cannot do. Uh, can they, uh, you know, um, sort of solicit for the uh, legitimate uh, donation? Um, part of the difficulty is that when the bill was in the Appropriations Committee, language was stricken apparently unintentionally, and then it was put back in. There is significant confusion, um, and our uh, clients would continue or would like to uh, get some additional clarifying amendments. I've shared these amendments with the committee staff uh, as well as with the sponsor. Um, no resolution has been uh, uh, reached yet, but that is the uh, remaining issue that we would like to raise with the committee, and uh, thus we remain opposed. Other witnesses in opposition? 
Sandy Silverstein, representing Riverside County School Superintendents. In addition to the concern that Mr. Frost raised, we have a, the concern about the costs associated with the enforcement in the bill. We want to move to a support on this bill. We think it's a good measure and it will help us enforce actually the fee re, uh, restrictions that we sometimes have trouble enforcing on our sites. However, the bill we think does a little bit in the way of overkill with regard to this. The uniform complaint procedure in the bill we think is a good one and will work, but it also requires that this be um, audited through the compliance audit process that school districts go through. That's a cost to school districts. Anytime you increase the scope of our audits, audits we have to pay for that. To the extent that you can, uh, this bill can move forward without the audit requirement on top of the UCP, we don't think you need to have both. You'll get compliance with the first, and it will limit costs to districts, which we think is critical in this time. Um, with that, we would probably, and the other amendment, we would probably remove our opposition. Thank you. Dennis Myers, California Association of School Business Officials. Uh, just on that same topic, there's actually three levels of accountability in the bill. One is the complaint process. Two is a requirement that district superintendents uh, implement their own study and uh, on, on illegal fees. And then there's the audit. Um, we think the first two are sufficient um, to, to get to the heart of what the bill is trying to do. And we think that the third one with audits is unnecessary, overkill, very expensive. I would like to see that removed. We have no problem with the intent of where the bill is trying to go. Um, as um, Ms. Silverstein said, we, we, we appreciate the help to try to eliminate these fees, um, but we want to make sure it's done efficiently, so thank you. Michelle McKay Underwood on behalf of Clovis Unified, Torrance Unified, and the Metropolitan Education District. We would associate ourselves with the previous comments in our opposition. Terry Burns on behalf of the San Bernardino Area School Districts for Better Schools. Uh, to Mr. Frost's point is very much our point, is that there's a great deal of confusion about who can do what, who can't do what. To Ms. Silverstein's point about the audits, this gets into just a whole other layer of what are those folks doing and mm -hmm. how we put, put that in. So those are our concerns. Are there any other witnesses in opposition? Members of the committee? Assembly member, uh, just before you close, I really like this bill. And uh, when it will be amended, I would like to be added on as a co-author. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate that. Would you like to close? Absolutely. I, I want to have um, Brooks clarify uh, some of the issues that were brought up. But let me just tell you that I think the, the current form of the bill, I think we've addressed all the substantive um, issues that were raised by the opponents. Uh, request for additional clarifying amendments, I don't think are necessary, are, are necessary. Um, you know, quite frankly, we talk about the audit issue. The audit issue is already, um, it, it's an existing requirement for the school districts. And how are we gonna identify the schools that are charging illegal fees without some sort of audit, uh, audit to figure out what is really going on in our school districts? Uh, and I'll tell you, as a, as a chair of the Joint Legislative Audit Committee, uh, folks should welcome audits instead of fight them, especially when we're talking about taxpayers' money especially about the money that goes to our public school kids. Uh, and so uh, I just love, uh, would ask for you to support this one. Thank you. Uh, and Brooks, if you have any further information. I guess what we would just add one point with respect to the audits and this idea of the overlapping accountability mechanism. The only preventative um, accountability provision in this bill uh, is the fact that the superintendent has to make a determination on an annual basis internally you know, are we in compliance with constitutional law that's been in place since 1879? Uh, the audit doesn't independently investigate whether there were fees. They simply make sure that that determination was made for that year. Uh, so there's nothing particularly costly about that. It mirrors existing accountability mechanisms. And so in that way, it simply ensures that that's happening in every district every year, uh, simply as a check. Is there a motion on the bill? The bill's been moved by Senator Price. Would you like to close? Members, thank you. I appreciate the discussion, and again, the intent of this bill is to ensure that every student in California has an access to free public school education. Our poor kids uh, should not be uh, put in this predicament. And again, I want to reemphasize we are not um, uh, prohibiting folks from donating to our schools for extracurricular activities. This bill is very clear, and I respectfully ask for your eye vote. Uh, I think the motion is do pass. Secretary, please call the roll. Lowenthal? Aye. Lowenthal, aye. Runner? Alquist? Aye. Alquist, aye. Blakesley? Hancock? Huff? Blue? Price? Aye. Price?
Price, aye. Simidian? Vargas? You have three votes. We're going to place that on call for the absent members. Thank you, Senator. Members, thank you. I'm having trouble counting. I know, but <laughs> you're doing fine. Our next Assembly Member Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I would venture to say that this too is a good bill, and be honored if you'll be added as a co-sponsor as well. Ah, <laughs> is that true? <laughs> Let's get the bill out first. <laughs> then we'll deal with it. Uh, yeah, exactly. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Good for you. Mr. Right. Mr. Chair uh, and members, uh, um, AB 227 takes a proactive approach to fight cyberbullying and protect students using the Internet in our public school systems. Um, this measure requires a school district seeking a state federal education technology grant to do three things. One, to use content control software on school computers uh, to establish clear, clear guidelines to prevent cyberbullying and to inform students of the consequences of cyberbullying. And then third, uh, to inform students for an appropriate, of the appropriate use of mobile communication technology. Simply, Senators, uh, the Internet is a great educational tool that can be used to increase student success. Uh, unfortunately, we have all heard of incidents where the Internet has also been used to harass, to intimidate, and to bully students across uh, the country. Uh, these in incidents have had devastating personal impacts on students, many of whom who have also been subject to physical violence, and several whom have obviously been victims of suicide. Uh, AB 227 uh, will aid in preventing uh, future tragedies by helping students learn the responsible use of technology and provide important tools to keep students safe while on and offline. Uh, there is absolutely no opposition to this measure. We have witnesses here today, uh, Daryl Raglan, a t the teen president of Sacramento uh, chapter of Jack and Jill of America, and Chelsea Shannon, Jack and Jill of America. And so I would like to ask you to hear uh, these witnesses in support of the bill. I move the bill. Thank you, Senator. Bill's been witnesses in support. Hi, my name is Daryl Ragland. I'm the current teen president of Jack and Jill of America Incorporated. And I'm in full support of this bill because I have been victimized of cyberbullying myself. Um, I was at one of the rallies and I had fallen down several bleachers. Now, the rally I didn't think was being videotaped, but other students had taken a video. The video was then posted on Facebook to where people could comment, like, and post it to other people's walls. So the incident of where I could take the laughter at school ended up coming and following me at home, and then it continued. So I'm in full support of this bill because I don't want any other students to have to endure the arduous humiliation that I had to. My name is Chelsea Shannon, and I am the former president of the Sacramento chapter of Jack and Jill. I am in full support of this bill because it, I have not personally been affected by cyberbullying, but my friends that have, it has affected my schoolwork because with um, the talk about everything, it tends to be a distraction from other students. And it is, with, the, with this bill, the prevention, it brings about not having the problem. And without the problem, there is no problem to fix. Are the witnesses in support? Debbie, look on behalf of California State PTA. We believe that every student is entitled to a safe school environment, and we recognize and agree with the author that cyberbullying is an increasing problem in our schools and communities with sometimes very tragic consequences. AB 227 is timely and needed as technology plays a growing important role in preparing our students for the 21st century global economy, it's critical that, that we students learn responsible use of technology and districts employ tools to keep students safe while online. We respectfully ask for your I vote. Thank you. Are there any other witnesses in support? Before, oh, here, just a second. Other witnesses in support? Pam Bichilla on behalf of the San Francisco Unified School District in support. Thank you. Are there Thank other witnesses? Before I call up witnesses in opposition, tell me a little bit about Jack and Jill of America. I don't know anything about it, and so about you. And Jack and Jill of America is a community service organization that's dedicated to empowering and bettering youth. 
So it is a predominantly a minority group that encourages other minorities to go out and be better their community. We go on several trips, we go on conferences, clean up parks. Um, Testify in the legislature. Of course, <laughs> of course. It's a, it's a very good organization and I encourage everybody to participate in it. We do well, a lot well, of fundraisers in Sacramento and throw dances and a lot of stuff. Funds well, well, raise funds for this. And um, recently we had a scholarship for some of the teens in the Sacramento area. Good, thank you. Are there any witnesses in opposition? Bringing it back, are there, it's, the bill has been moved by Senator Alquist. Senator Price. Yeah, just uh, this comment, certainly applaud the author on, uh, on the legislation and the intent and the uh, sponsors and the witnesses. A very uh, uh, compelling uh, 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 statements made by you both. We certainly know Jack and Jill, well established. Uh, organization nationwide, matter of fact, probably internationally, but uh, has been very instrumental in providing uh, uh, very positive uh, guidance to young people uh, in the community for many years. And uh, and uh, your testimony this morning certainly uh, is a testament to that. So congratulations on your your ongoing efforts and supporting this legislation. And I'm happy to support the bill. Thank you. Assembly member, would you like to close? Yes, I just, again, want to uh, thank the members for uh, your support, uh, senators, and also like to thank uh, our witnesses here today. Um, it's one thing to have adults testify in favor of the bill, but when you have young individuals, young bright minds and leaders uh, coming forward to say, this is something I need to help me in school and to be successful, that's a different thing. And so I certainly want to applaud uh, the witnesses and thank them for uh, their support uh, of this bill as well. And I respectfully ask uh, for your eye vote. Thank, Thank you. you. The, the bill has been uh, moved by Senator Alquist. Do pass. Secretary, please call the roll. Lowenthal? Aye. Lowenthal, aye. Runner? Alquist? Aye. Alquist, aye. Blakesley? Hancock? Huff? No. Huff, no. Lou? Price? Aye. Price, aye. Semidian? Vargas? You have three votes. Thank you. Assembly member, we're going to place that on call for the absent members. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Members. Is it Hernandez next? Hernandez? Assembly member Hernandez. Before Senator Assembly <laughs> member Hernandez comes up, he's already up. Uh, is there, we, we, well, I'll wait until, well, is there, Two members. Is there a motion on AB 13 night? The bill's AB 13, which is due pass, has been moved by, and we, to public safety, has been moved by Assembly Member Alquist. No, Senator Alquist. Listen to me. I'm Lakey this morning. Senator Alquist. Secretary, please call the roll. Lowenthal? Not voting. Runner? Alquist? Aye. Alquist, aye. Blakesley? Hancock? Huff? Aye. Huff, aye. Lou? Price? Simi Price? My <coughs> boy. Simidian? Vargas? That bill, uh, AB 13, has two votes. We'll place it on call for the absent member. Assembly member, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I present to you today AB 372. This bill would ensure the success of our returning veterans by breaking down some of the barriers to pursuing a college degree by allowing them to receive prior learning assessment as part of the California Community College's matriculation process. California has a vast population of veterans totaling roughly 1.9 million as of 2010. These honorable men and women risk sacrificing their lives for our country on the front lines. Every year, tens of thousands of veterans return from serving our country. Approximately 30,000 came home in California just last year. But what happens when they return? How do they assimilate? Our veterans face many unexpected challenges in their journey back home. Uh, some will have to deal with more extreme aftershocks of war. Others will struggle with very basic forms of assimilating back to civilian life, such as getting a college degree and finding employment. Members, we are well aware of the grim job market in California with unemployment rates currently still above 
But what you may not know is that the job market for California veterans is even bleaker with unemployment rates staggering at about 25%. According to the California Unemployment Department, uh, veterans have uh, had much more difficult time finding jobs and, than their non-veteran peers. Uh, so please allow me to raise a third question to members of this committee. What is California doing to ease this transition for our returning veterans relative to uh, some of the foreseeable challenges that he or she will face in obtaining a college degree? I introduced this bill because I have heard so many stories about the challenges that some of our veterans are facing with regard to translating some of their relevant military service training and technical certification into college level academic credit. AB 372 is, cri is a critical bill that would create efficiencies within our community college. AB 372 would streamline the higher education process by allowing for a prior learning assessment for veterans, trade apprentices, and journey level professionals. Here to testify in support today is Staff Sergeant Reed Milborn, a student veteran, and Dana Nickel, representing many of veterans related, re related organizations throughout California. Thank you, sir. Witnesses in support. Thank you, sir. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members, or actually I think it's afternoon now. It's always a pleasure.